Here's another example of how, we, how we're going to use that great handy equation to solve a problem like this. Again, it involves work, energy, and power. Uh, power is something we'll cover later, so there's mostly work and energy. And uh, let's read the problem here. It says a pulley is suspended from the ceiling, a mass of 80 kilograms is suspended on one side, and a mass of 40 kilograms on the other side. If the 80 kilogram mass starts at a height of 2 meters, how fast will it be moving when it reaches the ground? So let's draw a diagram of what that looks like. So here's a ceiling, here's a pulley, and we suspend a mass of 80 kilograms on one side. So let's call that mass 1 is equal to 80 kilograms. And on the other side, we have a mass. Oh, let me make that a little bit longer, otherwise it doesn't look very good. So let's say it, uh, it's like this. So this is M2, which is equal to 40 kilograms. Let's say if the floor is over here and the, uh, the height here, uh, H initial is equal to 2 meters. Okay, I think you can see the picture now. No, you have to hold things in place and then you let go and the 80 kilogram mass is going to start accelerating downward, the 40 kilogram mass is going to accelerate upward. And how fast will this 80 kilogram mass be moving when it hits the ground? So the question then would be, V final is equal to question mark. All right. Again, the equation we're going to use is the any work input to the system plus whatever potential energy initial you had plus whatever kinetic energy initial you had is equal to potential energy final plus kinetic energy final plus any heat lost due to overcoming friction or wind resistance or anything like that. And I think we can assume here, it doesn't mention anything about friction, that there's no friction anywhere. It's a massless, frictionless pulley, so that right away we can realize that there's no heat lost in this case. We can call that zero. And assuming that uh, nobody's doing any pushing or anything like that, there's no work input, so we can call that zero as well. So it just becomes an interplay between potential and kinetic energy. So, um, We don't know what the starting height is of the 40 kilogram mass, but does it matter? Not really. We can have different reference points for either mass, and we realize that if the 80 kilogram mass drops 2 meters, we can then assume that the 40 kilogram mass will rise 2 meters, which means it will gain potential energy as the 80 kilogram mass will lose potential energy. So even though we may not know what its initial height is, we can say that the initial height of the, uh, of the second mass, so H2 initial, is equal to zero as a reference. And uh, we, could, we could call this equal to zero. It doesn't matter. Or for the case of the uh, first mass, we can call the ground H, uh, not initial, but H reference, the reference height, uh, equal to zero meters uh, for the uh, First mass. It really doesn't matter if we use different reference heights as long as we stay relative to that. Okay, so based upon that, if I call this zero height for the first mass here, and I call this zero height for the second mass, we can then keep that as a reference and work the problem that way. So what's the initial potential energy? Well, the initial potential energy is whatever potential energy this mass has plus the initial potential energy this mass has. But since I defined the initial height of this mass as zero, it does not have any potential energy. But this one does have potential energy because I defined the initial height or the reference height for that one here down on the ground, so we know it's two meters above that. So in that case, we can say that it's m1g times h1, or in this case, h initial. We call it h initial there, so I'll call this h initial. The other one does not have any initial potential energy because I consider that to be zero height. Plus, how about kinetic energy? Well, assuming that everything started from rest, I was holding things motionless until I let go, there's no movement, so no initial kinetic energy. How about final potential energy? Well, the mass one will have reached the ground, and since that was its reference height, there was, there's not going to be any potential energy relative to this. But this mass will have gained a height of 2 meters. So we can say that 
the final potential energy will be m2g, the second mass, gained, gaining a height of, um, and I'll just put h down, gaining a height of 2 meters. So this block will have reached this point right here, so we'll have gained, let's say, a height of h. What about kinetic energy? Well, just before the big block hits the ground, the big block will be moving down, and the little block will be moving up at the same velocity. Different direction, but same velocity. So for energy is as far as energy is concerned, kinetic energy doesn't care what the direction is, only what the magnitude is. So we can say that the kinetic energy final will be 1 half times the mass of the big block times the velocity final squared plus 1 half times the little block and 2 times the velocity final squared realizing that they both will be moving at the same speed, different direction, so magnitude-wise, same velocity. All right, so now we have an equation, and all I have to do now is find out what my final velocity is, so I need to solve this equation for v final. To do that, I'm going to move this over to the, to the other side, so we have m1gh sub naught minus m2gh. In this case, h sub naught and h will be the same number, because h sub naught is 2 meters, and so will be h when the block reaches that height. That equals 1 half m1 v final squared plus 1 half m2 v final squared. So now I can go ahead and factor out a v final squared on the right side. So I have m1 gh0 minus m2 gh equals v final squared times 1 half m1 plus 1 half m2. And then if I divide both sides by what's in the brackets, I end up with m1gh sub so naught minus m2gh, all divided by 1 half m1 plus 1 half m2, and that equals v final squared. And finally, I take the square root of both sides, and of course I need to turn the equation around so it looks a little better. So I can say that v final is equal to the square root of, I have m1 g h sub naught minus m2 g h all divided by 1 half m1 plus 1 half m2. And then all I have to do is plug in what those numbers are. So this is equal to the square root of m1 is 80 kilograms times g, which is 9.8 meters per second squared, times h sub naught, we said was 2 meters, because the block started at a height of 2 meters above its reference height, minus 40 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared, times the change in height, it gained a height of 2 meters, and I have to take the whole thing and divide it by 1 half m1, which is 80 kilograms, plus 1 half times the second mass, 40 kilograms. And then if I use a calculator, I will find out what its final velocity was. All right. So we have 40 times 9.8 times 2. Multiply times 2, and divide that by 120. Oop, I didn't do it right. Let me do this again. So it's 40 times 9.8 times 2. And multiply times 2, and divide it by 120. And then I take the square root of both sides, or the square root of the right side, I should say, and I get... 3.61, or 3.6, so that's equal to 3.6, and now units-wise, I have meters times meters, which is meters squared, divided by second squared, so meters squared divided by second squared, and, but I take the square root of both sides, so I end up with meters per second, and so that is the final answer. When the big block hits the ground, it'll be moving at 3.6 meters per second. So again, you can see, using this equation, you can solve a lot of these types of problems. All right, give that a try. See what you think.